Thank, uh, thank you very much, Ali. Thank you very much, and welcome, everybody. I thought the a Superman slide is a good slide to start with. Um, so often I hear in organizations that we have a crisis, we have a problem, we have a, there's something going wrong. Uh, we must get more leadership. Leadership is the answer to this crisis that we have. And almost any crisis, whether it's because of the economy or because of a slow market or because of reduced budgets, because our products are not good enough or we don't think they are, because of better competition that we have just encountered, because we have low morale and so on. Almost any problem, people often say we need leadership. That's our answer. And we need superhero leaders to come in and lead us out of this problem. And so the cry goes up for these heroes to swoop in. So that's why this picture is doing here of Superman just about to get out of his suit and into his, his special clothing and go and save the day. But one of the problems with this idea of just going out and seeking leadership is, is actually leadership does not stand on its own in an organization. It's dependent on a lot of other things within the organization. Uh, and unless those things are all lined up to support the leader, the leader will not be able to succeed. Um, it, there's one very common overlooked reason, amongst many others, of course, uh, but one is that uh, the uh, learning environment is overlooked. And what this webinar is about is to help you understand how leadership and learning are inextricably linked together and how that matters and then some of the things you can start looking at to deal with that. Uh, so that's the core idea behind this, this webinar. So let's, hopefully I can, uh, hang on, press the next button. Ah, there we are. So there's this relationship between leadership and learning. It's not quite so obvious why that's important until we put a third step into that chain and this is around engagement. And then it becomes a bit more obvious what's actually happening. What I want to do is just look at these different steps and explain how that's happening and how this interaction is playing out in practice. So if we looked at the first of those steps, uh, engagement happens as a result of leadership. I think, and especially for an audience like this, for a leadership institute, that's a bedrock of faith in the way that leadership is promoted and talked about is that engagement is one of the outputs of leadership, one of the outcomes that we desire. And one of the things that engagement is about is people want to participate in what the leader is espousing. That vision that the leader has, people want to participate that, they want to get involved, they want to be part of something significant that that leader is talking about. And of course the opposite of that is if there's no leadership, there'll be no engagement. Perhaps there'll be enough engagement because people just want to get their paycheck at the end of the month, but even then. So it's important that we have leadership to get that engagement. This is fairly fundamental to most leadership thinking. And then we look at the next step in the chain and how engagement affects learning. Let's assume for a minute that we do have good engagement. We've got good leaders, we've got good engagement. What will that mean to the people? If the leader has a vision that's a bit different to the status quo, and of course, if it is, all good leadership visions are different. They move people on from where they are to somewhere better. So by definition, a leader's vision will almost always involve change, and if it involves change, it will almost always require that people learn something in order to step up to that change, in order to be able to do what they need to do to get engaged with that change. Now, if people are engaged, what they will do is they will find out what they need to find out in order to support the leader in going where the leader wants to go. See, leadership tend, or, or learning tends to be goal-oriented in, in adults. They're out there to, to learn for a reason. They want to get what they need to learn in order to participate in what they need to participate in. So if they've got a problem, they will very happily go and learn what they need to learn in order to deal with that problem. If they don't have a problem or they don't have a vision, they don't have something they want to achieve, actually there's not really a great deal of incentive to learn. Uh, it's If you deliver training, 
that does not really relate to a, a, a clear and present goal, the learning really won't work. People will learn when they have a, have a, a reason to learn, when there's an outcome, when they want to get learning. Um, but clearly, of course, if the engagement's not there to learn, then the learning won't happen. And this is again, so now we have a clear line of sight between the leadership and the engagement and the learning that may take place as a result of that engagement. Now if we look at the chain from the other direction, this starts to get a bit more interesting. Uh, if we have learning going on, how does that affect engagement? When, when people learn new things in order to pursue a goal, it makes the pursuit of that goal easier. The goal seems closer and more attainable. Uh, a goal that you can reach out and almost touch is much more motivating than a goal that seems impossible because I can't imagine being able to do that. So that makes the goal less attainable. So learning how to do something makes outcomes and goals more attainable, or at least are perceived to be more attainable, and that will actually encourage engagement. I will be very easy for me to get more and more engaged with an outcome or a future that I can see that I am capable of being a part of that. If I feel that I'm not capable of being a part of that because I, I can't learn enough or I can't find out what I need to find out, then actually my engagement or my desire to reach that goal uh, will be overcome by a feeling of perhaps helplessness even. So if the barriers to the learning are too high, then actually that will affect engagement. I hope that makes sense. If the barriers are too high for the learning, then people will actually lose their engagement, even if they had it in the first place. And what that tends to mean is the engagement has to be super high in order to make it uh, strong enough for people to try and break down those barriers to what they need to learn. Otherwise, it's just frustration if those barriers are too high. And by barriers, I mean things that get in the way of them doing what they need to do in order to follow the leader. Um, this could be things like processes or procedures that are in place that get in the way. Uh, it, it could be they can't find the information they want. They can't get the training they need. Basically, they're just not being enabled to learn what they need to learn. So therefore, they end up not being engaged. And it's, so that learning is a, uh, or lack of learning can be a barrier to engagement. And that also works the other way between leadership and engagement. If engagement then starts to wilt away because the learners can't do what they want, then actually they'll, they'll stop following the leader and the leader will be left out there on their own. And of course the leader on their own without followers is not really a leader anymore because leadership's a bit dependent on having followers, or well, certainly the leadership cannot be effective if there are no followers. Um, so people, if they lose their desire to participate because they can't follow, they're not enabled to follow, will then not follow, and of course that then undermines anything that you've done in terms of leadership training or leadership development. So that gives us an idea of what's actually going on um, between this sort of leadership and learning. And one of the things that's important about this is what uh, many people have termed the learnscape. Uh, this term has been used in a variety of ways, but the way I'm using it here is the learning environment that surrounds people in an organization. And this learning environment is an ecosystem that comprises all that is within or around an organization that has an impact on learnings. Uh, employees exist within this learnscape and how much or, or how easily they learn depends on how well the learnscape is functioning. The, the effectiveness of this learnscape will determine whether an organization's leaders can be successful. And that's interesting because what I've seen is organizations pour a lot of money into leadership training and leadership development programs and they can be wonderful programs but if they haven't taken care of the learnscape that's in that organization, people cannot learn what they need to learn in order to follow those leaders, and the leadership program does not produce the results that everybody hoped for. And 
people blame all sorts of things, but I've seldom seen them actually realize that the problem is the landscape or the enablement of followers, the enablement of those followers to learn what they need to learn. Now, what's really interesting is if the landscape is working really well, you can get away without having massively superhero leaders. If your landscape is working poorly, the only way your leaders will be able to be effective is if they are really super leaders. And unfortunately in the world today, there are super leaders, but not so many of them. And of course, most organizations don't have super leaders, and certainly not across all the different management levels in an organization. So it is really important to have your landscape operating and functioning well so that the people don't have too many barriers to what they need to learn in order to follow the leaders they do have. And this is actually very great because then you can get away with, uh, with leaders who are much smaller than others around. So there's an interesting picture of a small leader with a lot of followers. I'm always amused at that picture. I'm assuming it's a dog training school and they're teaching the dogs to sit still while a cat walks in front of them. Now here's something interesting about learnscapes. Um, most of what goes on in a learnscape in terms of the learning is informal. It's learning that happens outside of the formal training of a classroom or uh, even a webinar or an e-learning course. It's the informal learning that's happening off the radar, outside of often the awareness even of the L&D people in an organization. Most of the know-how that people require in order to do their jobs, they actually learn informally either through experiential learning or social learning. And there's a, a model that's been put together which some of you may have come across, um, the 70-20-10 model. Um, this ratio is just a model, it's not a recipe for success, it's just a way of thinking to help us remember that a lot of learning happens outside of the classroom in an informal sense. The 70 is the 70% 70 of learning that roughly 70% is experiential and roughly 20% is social learning and then around 10% is formal. Now, this, there's been a number of research projects around this. Um, these figures are not cast in stone and they vary from person to person. Someone new in an organization will probably have a lot more formal learning. Their ratio of 10 will be higher than that. Uh, more senior people will often find that their, the amount of informal learning they, learning they are doing is huge in comparison to anything else. Um, the real benefit of this model is simply to get people thinking about the informal learning that's taking place. And this model is being used as a, a thought seed, if you like, or a thought encourager in a lot of big companies around the world now, huge numbers of them. Uh, is very, very common. Any search on the web will, will get you more information about it. Um, what's interesting about that is if all this learning is happening informally, how are people actually doing that? And by informal learning we're meaning things like having a look at the web when I want to find something out, asking a colleague when I need some more information, looking up something on an intranet, um, going and finding some old uh, letters or old proposals or something filed away in the filing system in order to see how it's been done previously. There are so many ways that informal learning happens and they vary immensely from organization to organization. Uh, so I think it's, uh, but the, the key thing to remember is that there is this step that people need to take in order to get what they want to get in order to do the job they want to do, in order to follow the leader they want to follow. And one thing that you might think of here is there's a moment of truth. And a moment of truth happens when someone in an organization comes to, if you like, uh, say it's a fork in the road. They've got a choice when they hit that fork in the road. Uh, they can either do what they need to do to follow the leader 
or they can hit a barrier and then they find that they don't have the motivation to be bothered to do what they need to do to follow the leader. So those moments of truth are those moments when an employee can act one way or the other. When they go down that, which fork in the road is easier for that employee to follow? Is it easier for them to follow the leader or is it easier for them to not bother? And that's, that's why it's important that all of the things that enable followers, learning just being one of them, but there are probably a number of others as well, all of those things that enable followers need to be in place in order for a leader to be effective and successful. So that's really what this is about in terms of you know, how do you get those moments of truth and, uh, to swing your way when you're a leader. And one of my suggestions is to make sure that the learnscape is operating well. In other words, all of the things that surround people that are effective in terms of helping them learn in the moment what they need to do when they're right at a task doing something, what do they need to do in order to succeed at that task. See, there's a, there's a lovely quote by Jan Carlsen, who was the chief executive of Scandinavian Airlines Systems, uh, and he was responsible for a huge turnaround of that organization some years ago. He, he coined the phrase moment of truth, actually. Um, but another uh, quote that I love using of his is, an individual without information cannot take responsibility. An individual with information cannot help but take responsibility. So if you give the people what they need in terms of information and the opportunities to find out and learn what they need to learn, then they will be able to follow and they will be able to then succeed in reaching the vision that the leader has pushed out for them there in the future. So really what I'm doing is encouraging you to, to, to look at what you need to do to invest into your learnscape so that your managers and those within your organization can lead and succeed. Um, and really when I'm talking about the learnscape here, um, again, the learnscape, you might liken it to a landscape, a landscape like a garden. You can tend your garden, you can work with your garden, you can help it grow, you can make it produce lovely vegetables or beautiful flowers. But actually you didn't create the garden in the first place. The plot of land was there already. What the gardener can do can make that plot of land become wonderful and produce well. It's the same with the learning environment in an organization. It is already there. It is already happening. It is already a learnscape. So how can the learning and development people within an organization assist and operate within that learnscape to make it better, to make it more conducive to learning? and because of the 70-20-10 ratio, it makes a huge amount of sense to focus on the informal learning aspects of a learnscape. In other words, make the uh, ability of people to learn informally uh, high by giving them the kinds of tools and things that they need in order to do what they need to do to follow the leader. Now, this could be things like job aids. It could be good information on an intranet. It could be making sure that appropriate subject matter experts are available to them to contact when they've got a problem or a question. Um, there's so many things and really it's about talking to them and finding out well, what do they need? What are they missing? What frustrates them in terms of finding out what they need? Because as soon as there's a barrier or a, or a something in the way between them and what they need, they will just turn off unless, of course, the engagement is super high because you've got a superhero leader. But we know those aren't so common. So in a way, this is about helping with the working with the leaders that you do have. So one way to get more mileage out of those leaders, uh, more effectiveness out of those leaders, is to work with the learnscape. And sometimes that's actually a better investment of the money than pouring it all into leadership training for people. So you do need to do some leadership development, no question of that. Together with it, I think you also need to do some development of your learnscape and the systems and processes that are perhaps in the way of enabling the followers. So you need to get the followers enabled. 
So that's really the core message here is how can you work with enabling followers? So that's, it, it's a little, it's very simple and I think it's often easy to answer questions that people might have around this. Um, so what I'd love to do is take any questions, is to uh, expand on this and there's a couple of links there that you can get some more information as well if you want. So uh, Ali, are we ready for any questions? Uh, folks, uh, if you have questions, uh, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Matthews. Uh, we'll open for the Q&A now. So, folks, if you have any questions, you could uh, please raise your hand, and I'll be able to give you an opportunity to ask him directly. Or you could uh, put your questions in the chat box or question box. I see there are a few questions uh, already posted. So uh, let me try to read them over. Just a second. Uh, yeah, there is a, there's an interesting short question. Uh, is leaders' main job to produce leaders or followers? <laughs> That's a very good question. How do leaders procreate? Um, uh, I, I think that's actually not an either or question. I think leaders are required or should be producing both. Um, lead, a senior leader in an organization needs to be ensuring there is succession planning in place and needs to be ensuring there are other leaders uh, because you need more than one in any organization. Leadership should be something that happens at all levels in an organization. Uh, so there is a requirement, I believe, for leaders to produce other leaders, uh, if only for, for just for pure succession planning reasons. Um, but also, clearly, leaders, if they don't have followers, cannot be successful as leaders. So it is about encouraging followers and making sure that those followers have what they need in order to be able to follow. Uh, so I don't think it's an either-or question. Um, so I hope that answers what you're asking. Uh, well, certainly I hope so. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question from Brother Saad Fati. Uh, the question is, is there any criteria for the successful learning scape? That is to measure if you are going well with good learning environment or not? Um, I think it's something that it's difficult to say there's criteria there. You need each organization will have different requirements about their learning landscape. Um, some organizations will need much more in terms of formal training. Others will have almost purely informal learning going on. So in all ways, what you need to be doing is checking in with the people who are operating within that learning landscape to say, how is it working for you? So it is really the inhabitants of that landscape that give you the answer as to whether the landscape is working well or not. I can't give you a strict set of criteria to say, if you do this or if these are the answers to this questionnaire, then your landscape is working well. Uh, I don't think, unfortunately, it's that simple. In many ways, I wish it was, but I don't think it is. So it's the inhabitants of that landscape will be able to tell you whether it's working for them. Okay, um, let's move to the next question. This one is from uh, Sister Sibyl Sahin. The question is, at my company, we add one person to the 70-20-10 model and we call that self-awareness. Learning about yourself, what do you think about this? Uh, well, I'm a great fan of self-awareness, and in fact, it's one of the primary components of the emotional intelligence models that are around. Um, I'm not quite sure how that necessarily relates to 70-20-10. Um, perhaps you could clarify what your question is about, um, or is it just about self-awareness as a concept in and of itself? Uh, let me try to see if Sabil, if your mic is working, I'll try to unmute you. Uh, uh, Sabil, can you hear us or can you speak directly? I've just unmuted your microphone. Hello? Uh, I think she has a Perhaps she has no yeah, mic. The mic. She, she said no, 70, 20, 10, dash 1. I don't know. She wrote something. I Yes, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, what maybe so. Really want to, if you clarify, are. you can repost your question and detail, or uh, let me know if you can unmute your mic again. I'll give you an opportunity to speak to him. You know, let me move. Um, le informal learning. Uh, 
through virtual engagements. Can that can it be considered counterproductive compared to a handshake? Compared to a handshake, uh, I don't understand that uh, question either. I think um, uh, maybe I think what I understand is uh, the virtual engagements. Uh, can they be considered more uh, counterproductive compared to a handshake, like a physical learning class? Or oh, I see. Um, well, a lot of informal learning is actually is 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 face to face or physical anyway. It's just happening outside of a scheduled interaction. Um, the the things that might be included with informal learning are observing. Uh, a master, like an apprentice, might observe uh, a master carpenter holding a chisel a certain way, and then later that day, that apprentice will find themselves holding that that chisel to carve wood in the same way, uh, without necessarily even realizing they've copied the way the master did it. So observational learning has a huge part to play in informal learning, as does experiential learning, where you are. Uh, task conscious, that is you're aware of what's happening as you do a task and although learning is not a formal outcome of you doing the task, you notice the results you get and then next time you do it you may modify how you do the task because you are seeking slightly better results. So there's a lot of learning which happens actually completely outside of conscious awareness. Um, most of us know how to run a household for example and yet we never formally set out to do that. We didn't go to training courses. Uh, we just learnt along the way uh, how to run our households. Um, and so that is informal learning. It's, it's, it's just being conscious of the results we're getting as we're doing things. Okay. Um, oh, we have another interesting, rather philosophical. Should leader be possessed with thoughts about inspiring others? Or should he she be only concerned about planning and taking actions on what leading from front demands on the job, which may indirectly be considered as inspiration for others? <laughs> yes, a, a philosophical question indeed. Um, I think if you make leadership too mechanical, then it fails because it loses authenticity in my personal view. Um, I, I think it's important to be inspiring and inspired both uh, as a leader. So you have something that you're seeking to achieve, you have a vision, you have a, an idea of what the future can be and, and that you would like it to be and that you think it should be uh, and you're encouraging people to help you and follow you to, to create that future. That needs to be inspiring. If you sit and think at a technical level, how do I do that? actually you won't come across as a passionately authentic leader. You'll come across more like a mechanic, perhaps even someone who's seeking to manipulate others. Um, and so I think there's a very strong balance to be had there. Certainly uh, if you are, let's put it another way, I don't think leadership stands alone apart from management. They are actually two pieces that need to be put together. I think good leaders always, in my opinion, have to be at least reasonable, if not good managers as well. And by that I mean they need to be able to look after the processes, procedures and the administrative side of what they're doing up to a certain extent. Um, and, and that's more the, the, the detailed technical aspects of it. Um, I, I think it's, it, it's difficult to separate leadership and management too tightly because I, I think they do need to sit together and to me they are part of, in many cases, the same role. Um, but I think the answer to your question really is about is the leadership still authentic? And I think you can lose that authenticity if you make it too mechanical or, or too, um, uh, you know, too, uh, I don't know, you've thought about it too much. Do you know what I mean? It's just, it, does that make sense? I hope that's a. <laughs> I hope that's yeah, a I think uh, it's a, thank you very much. I know it was a sort of philosophical. So let's move to another one from Mr. Dalib Kapola. The question, uh, it's rather long. Let me try to read. Uh, uh, there are, okay, he started with, they have been nominated for the leadership development program because they have potential, un 
potential. Unfortunately, they're extremely busy with the result as a facilitator of the leadership development program. We find it difficult to get the person help us with the pre-assessment before the training program and after the facilitation of the program. The senior executives also talk about the commitments towards the program, but when it comes to giving feedback, they fail to give in such they fail to give a feedback. In such an environment, how can we make the LDP program more successful? An interesting question. I, I think this uh, there was a couple of different questions in there that I picked yeah. up. One of them is the um, apparent being too busy to do pre-work for a course. Um, if this is indeed the case, then clearly there isn't enough emphasis or executive sponsorship for that course because if a course, if, if the senior executives who are effectively signing off the budget to do a leadership course are serious about that course, they should also be making sure the people who are going on that course have sufficient uh, time in their schedules in order to do the pre-work and pre-assessments and other things that are required so the course actually works well. Um, so really that's a, again a senior leadership issue in making sure those uh, people going on the course are given the time and in fact told that you are now tasked with doing this and take other duties off them so that they can actually do that work and make the most out of the course. Um, so I, I think I would take this back to the senior leadership, the people who are paying for this course and say, are you, do you really want to waste your money? Because that's to some extent what I'm hearing from the question. Um, is this course really important to you? If it is, then you need to allow these people to do the course properly. If you, if you don't give them the time and the input and also the feedback, uh, uh, which is the second part of your question, how do you get the senior people involved with it, then clearly they haven't really bought into the course sufficiently. So I, I think there's a, a need to have them themselves more engaged with the fact that that course is the right thing to do and that it is what is needed. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, another one, uh, sort of a supplementary. Formal executive uh, leadership development programs provide opportunity for social learning and networking. What do you think about it? I think that's a, a great statement. Um, any formal program, there's always a mix of social and uh, experiential learning going on. You, it's difficult to really separate them out. This idea of 70-20-10 is still a, it's a mental construct that isn't true. It, it is just simply not true. But it's a model that we can use to help us think about things. But on a formal training course, there is a lot of informal learning always going on at the same time. And actually, the more you can structure your formal training courses to incorporate informal learning, facilitated discussions and things like that, actually, usually the, more, the better they will be. Um, there's a concept now in the, which is uh, having a lot of uh, headway in the university world particularly called the flipped classroom. Uh, that's F-L-I-P-P-E-D, flipped, in other words, flipped upside down. And in a traditional university training scenario, the lecture room was where students were given all the information and then they had to go away and do assignments or uh, talk to each other or do, uh, and um, sort of socialize, if you like, or discuss uh, with, with their uh, peers or someone else around that material. What the universities are doing now is they're making sure that all of their material is digitally available. And in fact, one university I spoke to recently said their, their catchphrase is digital by default. And the students are required to go and look through all this material and then they go on a tutored session, which are small group discussions around the material. So all of the social and informal learning is now happening at the scheduled tutorial and the factual exchange or the intake of information is happening on the student's uh, own personal schedule in the library or at home or wherever else they decide to do it uh, via the intranet. Uh, so this concept of a flipped classroom is now also coming more and more into organizational learning structures and uh, it's something I'm encouraging with uh, some of our clients and they're getting great results of focusing and making their 
face-to-face -face time in a, in, in, a, in a setting in a classroom much more informal by having workshops and facilitated discussions and role plays and those kind of things, having already done the knowledge intake previously from uh, books or from, uh, from online resources. So probably a long answer, but I hope yeah. that answers that. Certainly indeed. Uh, another interesting. Is it fair to understand informal learning in one line? That is, tell them what to do rather than how to do it. Interesting question. Um, I would probably back off that and say tell them what to do is still coming from the old command and control management structure. Um, and I would suggest, and it depends on the culture of the organization, that it's a, probably more about sharing the vision of where we all need to go. Um, and within reason, people will follow, up, follow that. Now, there's always going to be a need to say you must do this by Friday. I'm, I absolutely accept that. Um, but if the default position is tell them what to do, we still have uh, a boss who's just giving instructions. Um, in other words, a manager who's just laying down the law. Uh, and that won't actually necessarily get engagement. Good leaders don't often do that. Um, there's the old, uh, I can't remember the exact wording, and it's, uh, it's from English, so it may not be familiar. But there's a poem in English uh, which talks about don't, um, teach men how to build ships, teach them to yearn for the sea, uh, you know, teach them to want the open ocean, and then they'll go and build ships automatically. So I think, uh, it didn't quite answer the question perhaps, but it, it, I sort of ducked it sideways, but I would certainly encourage leadership is not just telling people what to do. Uh, so I agree. Uh, we have uh, one sh sort of a short question by Brother Mahiyuddin. Uh, so it's a micro question. How do you how to avoid unfavorable behavior of coworkers? That's that's an interesting question. Certainly in the context of this, yeah. um, if it, in, well, in the context of this webinar, it might be related um, to. If, if, a, if a colleague is actually getting in the way of, of, for example, me following the leader in my organization, I'm here, I want to follow my leader, I want to follow the, the, um, the chief, I really like the way this organization's going, but I've got colleagues who are getting in the way, who are obstructing progress, who are sabotaging or undermining the leader. I mean, that's, that's where that question perhaps fits within the context of this webinar. Um, and I'm actually not sure how you can really handle that. Um, it rather depends on how many of them are and, and to some extent if they have good reason. Not every leader is right in the direction they seek to take an organization. And if a lot of people say, hey, no, this is the wrong way to go, then perhaps the leader needs to be able to take that feedback and understand that they have some more work to do. Either they need <coughs> to change their vision to suit things that are better or good, better for the organization, or they need to do more work in bringing the followers in behind them because they clearly don't have a quorum. They don't have a sufficient tipping point of people willing to follow. Um, so maybe that answers the question about people obstructing. OK, uh, I think uh, one last question. Uh, so do you have any study findings on the effectiveness of informal learning with organizations which are culturally so diversified? or its universal applicability and effectiveness? Um, uh, well, if you look at the, at the, in the back of my book, there's, there's 137, I think it is, uh, references in there. There's a huge amount of reference material with studies from universities and major consultancies and other places around informal learning and its effects in different environments. I think the informal learning, one of the reasons that people often have wariness about it is they don't really understand what it is and the reason for that is most people don't understand when they are learning. Most people don't know what learning really is and how often it takes place and how ubiquitous it is. It's all around us all the time. And if I take a really simple example, um, if you go to the supermarket and you're looking for a tin of baked beans, 
Um, I'm not sure that's a brilliant diet, but let's just go with that. Uh, a tin of baked beans, and the supermarket has moved the baked beans to a different aisle, and you can't find them initially because they've moved. Eventually you find them, maybe you search for them, maybe you ask an assistant, but you do find the baked beans. And then you, you go to the checkout and you come out of the supermarket. If I was to stop you as you come out of the supermarket and ask you what you've learned, you would find that a quite strange question. But you see, what you have learned is the new aisle the baked beans are in. And if you go back to that supermarket next week to buy some more baked beans, you will know where they are and you will go straight to that aisle. So you've taken in some information, you've retained it, and you've modified your behavior in the future as a result of the information you've taken in. Now, by any standard or any definition, that's learning. And yet most people, if asked, wouldn't say they learnt anything. So there's a huge amount of learning that we do on a day-by-day, -day, almost minute-by-minute -minute basis that is totally out of our conscious awareness. And, and that's important. And it's only when you start realizing how much learning happens outside of conscious awareness that we start to realize how important this 70-20-10 ratio is, or at least that idea that so much learning is happening informally. Because so much of the informal learning that is happening is happening under the radar or out of conscious awareness. It's learning that's happening, but we're not even labeling it as learning. Most of us don't think of things we learn during the day. So and I think that's why there's this, you know, well, how do we prove informal learning? I, I don't think you really have to. Uh, there's a really interesting discussion, I'll just finish up on this, that I had with a very large pharmaceutical company uh, ooh, about two weeks ago now, with the head of learning and development. And it's uh, someone who came back to me with some uh, questions about my book. It was a fascinating conversation. But he was asking, well, how can I encourage the senior leaders in my organization to embrace informal learning as something that's actually happening and it's really important? and is vital to the organization. I believe it, I know it's important, um, but I'm having trouble really convincing some of these senior people because they, they don't get it. Um, and then he said to me, oh, by the way, I'm so glad I've just finished an interesting or quite distracting project on risk management. We were doing a reorganization in one of our divisions, and I was asked to do a risk management assessment of the biggest risks involved with this reorganization. I knew what the answer would be, but I went ahead, I did the survey, I wrote the report, and the answer was as expected. The biggest risk that people see in this reorganization of this division is the fact that there will be senior people who will take their redundancy package and they'll leave the organization, and it's the knowledge walking out the door as they walk out the door that is the biggest risk. And I said, well, if you've just had that survey and come up with that conclusion, and that information has been given to you by the senior leaders, the other people saying, or all the leaders in the organization, the other people saying that uh, knowledge walking out the door is the biggest risk, you've just got the best proof you could ever have that informal learning is totally vital. Because if the learning walking out the door, if the knowledge walking out the door was able to be trained in a classroom, you can just put on some more classroom training. But clearly, they realize the knowledge that's walking out the door is the experiential learned knowledge and the socially learned knowledge that is actually not able to be replicated in a classroom. So senior people in organizations already know how vital informal learning and experiential and social learning is. It's just they don't often then say, take that on to another step or two, saying, well, how do we actually leverage that? How do we harness it? Um, so I hope that's a useful example. Indeed, very interesting. And uh, as they say, experience is the best school. Yet the fool learns <laughs> no, no other. So, uh, no doubt, experiential learning is the key, and and uh, it's it's a major risk affording knowledge walking out the door. With that, I would like to conclude the webinar. Thank you very much, Mr. Paul Matthews, for your time and sharing this wonderful presentation and making it quite an interactive experience for all of us, and hopefully an experiential experience as well. So, and thank you all of those who participated in this webinar. Uh, we're glad to join us today. And uh, with that, I would like to conclude and would request the speaker, uh, our distinguished speaker, if you would like to give any concluding remarks. Um, well, just thank you very much for your time. Um, 
we've got a wonderful yeah. spring day here in the UK, and uh, I, I wish you have all the best for you wherever you are, uh, for you and your families. So go well and go in peace. Uh, thank you very much, sir. And uh, folks, I'm going to be ending this webinar uh, with a note that the recording of this webinar will be available on our community site, which is community.mile.org. Uh, and the soft copy of the presentation will be uploaded also, so please stay tuned to our community uh, with that. Um.